I grew up between East and West. I consider myself a very proud Indian American, but it took me quite a while to figure out how to balance the two sides of myself. Um, growing up, you know, I, we spoke Tamil at home, we spoke English at school. Um, I would, you know, I was the Indian kid in Texas, and then I was the ABCD in Madras. And as a good ABCD, I decided I had to go to college and become a doctor. So I went to college as a pre-med, and um, as you can probably imagine, my parents were extremely surprised when I called them after my second year and told them I wanted to do this. I became an opera and orchestra conductor, which is very far from medicine, but it was something that was really fascinating to me because as someone who grew up between two cultures, I had to find my voice. And for me, finding my voice really entailed becoming a musician. Um, my dad's first question to me, of course, when I, said, when I said that, is like, where did you even learn this? Um, where was this an idea? And growing up, I played trombone because good Indian kids played in musical instruments so that when you did your college applications, you had hobbies. And so I played a musical instrument most of my life, and by the time I got to college, I thought I need to learn more about this. And then the second question he asked me was, well, what do you have in common with music that was written by centuries-old, dead, white European males? which is a very fair question. And it actually is a question that we're facing right now in our art form. So as an opera and orchestra conductor, I often hear people of my generation who are American, who, are, who have grown up there, or who are European even, who look at me and say, what, why does this matter to me in the digital age? Well, to get to that, I have to talk to you about why I was inspired to go into music. And it would be primarily because of this old, dead, white European male. Um, this is Ludwig von Beethoven, a very serious musician, as you can tell. Um, he was the first European composer who knew that he was going to write for the future. He kept all his manuscripts, he knew his music would continue to be performed after he died. Um, and he was also a humanist. And I was really fascinated by the story that Beethoven wrote his third symphony in dedication to Napoleon when Napoleon became the first freely elected European leader. When Napoleon declared himself emperor, Beethoven was so angry that he scratched out Napoleon's name and left a hole in the manuscript. Um, this was also a composer whose Ninth Symphony is about the Brotherhood of Man. Um, and so here we had a composer who really, truly believed in people. Um, and the entire time he wrote all this music, he was going deaf. And so he was losing the greatest faculty that allowed him to do his art, and he had to keep that secret from people. So here's a humanist who liked people, but couldn't be around people lest they discover he couldn't hear the music he was writing. Um, and so for me, to hear this story and then hear the power of his music, and almost all of you probably know the fa most famous four notes in all of Western classical music. ba 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 bum Everyone knows that. And those were his notes, and they've resonated through hundreds of years. Well, cut to the future, and now I'm an opera conductor, and I'm working with an opera company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And they said, what would you like to do as your first opera? Well, for me, his opera is a really fascinating place to start. Um, so Beethoven's only opera is a bit of a confusing work. It is a piece with a very simplistic plot, but as you can imagine for me, music that is really important. Um, the plot is about a unfairly or improperly imprisoned political prisoner named Florestan. And Florestan was imprisoned by the evil Don Pizarro because Florestan had discovered all of Don Pizarro's corruption and was about to expose him. So Don Pizarro has kidnapped Florestan and thrown him in jail. Well, the, Florestan's great love, Leonora, has decided after two years she's going to find her husband. She's been searching for two years and disguises herself as a prison guard, as a man, gets a job at the prison in the hopes of breaking him out. That's pretty much the entirety of the plot, but it has really great music. And I kept thinking to myself, well, how, how do I make this relevant? You know, it's in the news, you know, at the time we did this, the Egyptian revolution was in the news. So this idea of freedom, revolution, fighting corruption, it's something we still deal with. This is not a foreign story to us. But we had to find a way to make it relevant to a younger audience and to a variety of audiences. And I kept thinking about what else I knew that had really simplistic plot but great music. And I thought, well, Bollywood. And so we decided to take a Beethoven opera and choreograph it in the style, really, of a 1950s Tamil film. Because for me, I knew, I knew the, um, the performances of Shivaji and Padmini much better than I knew Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, um, because that's what we grew up watching at home. 
And so we decided to do this, and I found a really incredible um, choreographer who's also a Kathak teacher and a Bollywood dance teacher who lived in Milwaukee, an amazing Indian artist, and we decided to collaborate on this production. One of the challenges I faced, of course, is the music of Beethoven doesn't necessarily lead, allow itself this idea of dance. So the first question to answer was, well, did you want to add tabla or merdangam or, you know, find ways to add some Indian rhythm to this? And I kept thinking to myself, if we're truly going to call ourselves a globalizing art form, shouldn't we be able to value the art as it was created and give it the honest performance? So I, I thought to myself, we can't really change the music of Beethoven. That would be apologizing for this music. But I also wanted to find a way to really capture this true idea of like Bollywood film and Indian dance. Um, too often now you see Bollywood productions of opera and it has like four backup dancers who are changing light bulbs behind the, the singer and they call that Bollywood and it really never had the feel, the true feel of Bollywood. Um, and again, we cheated, we used 1950s Tamil film. So here's a little excerpt of what we came up with. So, so I should tell you, Deepa's, Deepa Devasena was the choreographer. Her greatest challenge was teaching opera singers to dance in an Indian style. Now, opera singers are very highly trained singers, and they also have to have incredible breath control. And so for them to even volunteer to do this was fascinating to me. It was even more fascinating when I had two of the singers come up to me in anger, saying, Vishwa, we're really disappointed in you. And I said, why? And they said, well, you know, Floristan and Leonora are finally reunited, and you don't have us dancing while singing. And they said, this is the hardest duet in the entire Western repertory. And they said, well, yeah, but we should be dancing. That's how the films go. So they actually agreed to choreograph that. I'll show you a, second, a, a bit of that here in a second. Um, so for me, it was fascinating growing up between two cultures that wrestled with each other almost all of my life. And then to finally have the opportunity to create one piece of art that put them both together, I feel like for the first time in my life, I've been able to balance the East and West in myself. So here's some cool excerpts from the, from the opera. Um, and I want to kind of walk you through some of the, the things that I found from Tamil film that I was always fascinated by growing up. Um, so one of the next, the opening part of this next sequence is when Rocco the jailer is telling Fidelio, who is Leonora in disguise, and his daughter that while love is important for marriage, you also need money. <laughs> reunites with Leonora. And they're not allowed to kiss. And of course you need a grand finale with everybody dancing. particularly fond of the garlic. So what I'd like to leave you with is this one question. In a globalizing world, is there a way to globalize our art and not think of the ownership of the artist that created it, i.e. the country? Is it okay that we look at the music of dead white Europeans that's 300 years old and say it is still current, and somehow find art from Asia and combine the two. So can we globalize our art in the way we're globalizing our world?